Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. So today I'm using my Blue Yeti mic and I'm going to be talking to you about the RECA. The RECA is the Reading Instruction Competence Assessment and it's basically all about reading and if you know how to teach reading and how to teach kids how to read. And I took this test three years ago, right before I got my teaching credentials. It was pretty much the last test that I took before getting my credentials and I was able to get it done on the first try. So I'll be giving you some tips on how to pass the test, what the test looks like, and all of that. The practice test that I used was the Ready for Rika test preparation, which I will link below. I bought it on Amazon. It's by James Zerillo, and a lot of my teacher friends recommended this to me, and they passed on the first try too. The book pretty much just kind of covers everything you need to know about reading and how to teach kids reading. Okay, not everything, but a good amount. It also helped that in my undergrad, I took a link linguistics class and then I also took a class on how to teach reading but in your teaching credential program you are also required to take a reading class as well to talk about morphemes affixes blends and syllables and all of that I got that class waived because I already took it during my undergrad but don't fear in your teaching credential program you will be taking a class like that okay so the RECA is 70 questions and then they say that there are four focused educational tasks and then one case study but I really see this as there's five case studies. A case study is basically scenarios of if you were given this example of a child's work would you know how to kind of decipher what it means and would you be able to tell how the student is reading. So there's five of those after your 70 multiple choice questions. I won't be going over all 70 questions Questions, but I'll go over the practice exam and if you guys want to see a part two then leave a comment below and I'll make another video talking about the RECA exam. The RECA costs $171 so it's not as bad as the CSET but it is four hours long. I don't remember taking four hours on the CSET I did. I'm still working on a CSET video it's just it's so long and it's pretty difficult and I don't even know how I passed on the first try so I'm trying to work on how I can help you guys with that but the Rika on the other hand was not as bad and I really think that the classes I took helped but I took it because of it went towards my degree it wasn't just for fun okay let's get started so I'm gonna go over some of the questions and then just kind of talk to you about how I take these types of tests and how I decipher what it is they're really looking for I do have the answer key with me just to make sure I give you the right answers. So here we go. Okay, so now I'm just going to go over the questions. I'm going to read over the answers. So if this is a video that you want to listen to while you're, you're just driving, don't worry. You don't need to look at the test. I'm going to go over it with you and kind of start to think about which answer you would choose as I'm reading it. And then I will go over why certain answers are not the correct one. A sixth grader who has advanced in most areas of reading so he's advanced in most areas, has difficulty completing assigned reading selections. He appears motivated when he begins reading, but he has difficulty keeping his attention on the task at hand. Which of the following would be his teacher's best initial strategy for addressing this difficulty? So what is the teacher's best first idea or plan to address the fact that this kid, who is usually advanced in his reading, is not motivated? A. Adapting the students' reading assignments to reduce their complexity and level of cognitive challenge. B. Telling the student that his grades will be based in part on his ability to improve his concentration when he works on reading assignments. C. Breaking down the student's reading assignments into small steps and helping him learn to monitor his own attention and progress. Or D. Managing the student's reading assignment so that he generally has only one to work on at any given time. So because he's in sixth grade and he's also pretty, oh, and he's pretty, because he's in sixth grade and he is advanced in most areas of reading, we know that A is not it because A is basically saying that we need to reduce how complex or how difficult the reading is. But he should be okay. B, I wouldn't pick B because telling the students that his grade will be based in part on his ability to improve his concentration is more of like a threat. C, breaking down the students' reading assignments into small steps to help him so that he can monitor his own. I think that's a great answer because you're helping the student and giving him tools to pay closer attention and chunking what he needs to read and d managing the student's reading assignment so that he generally has only one to work on at any given time i feel like that's really up to the sixth graders choice of how 
he wants to monitor and if we do it for him completely where we only assign one thing at a time when other kids are doing multiple then that's not great either okay and the answer is c Number two, when creating lesson plans to promote specific reading skills, a teacher should make sure that each planned activity, oh, A, A, each planned activity for students is designed to strengthen or two or more specific reading skills. B, the targeted reading skills relate to an appropriate instructional progression and reflect students' needs. C, each planned activity connects students' reading, writing, listening, and speaking skills. And D, the targeted reading skills are grade appropriate and taught to all students using the same instructional methods. For sure, I know it's not D because we know that we cannot do blanket type lessons that just cover everyone and you hope that everyone just gets it all the same because students are not the same and they all learn very differently so no we don't want to use the same instructional methods for every single student um it's not a because each plan activity for students is designed to strengthen two or more specific reading skills maybe for one day you only want to focus on one reading skill and that's perfectly fine b the targeted reading skill relates to an appropriate instructional progression and reflects students' needs. I like that one the most because we're talking about appropriate instructional progression, meaning you know that they're going to improve on this scale and it reflects the students' needs, which is very important. So I would have either chosen B or C because it would be cool if every single lesson incorporated reading, writing, listening, and speaking skills. But in the question, it's asking well, how would you create lessons to promote a specific reading skill? So you're trying to hone in on specifics. So to answer that, I would go with B. And that is the answer. Okay, moving on to number three. An early elementary teacher could most effectively effectively support at home reading by a sending parents guardians a regular newsletter describing classroom reading activities b sharing with parents and guardians important articles from professional reading journals c recommending books that parents guardians would likely enjoy reading with their children or d providing parent guardians with periodic reports on their child's progress in reading i wouldn't choose a because sending a newsletter doesn't necessarily mean that Parents would take that and say, oh, I should read with my kids at home. Um, they would just see like, oh, cool. They're doing things in their classroom. Uh, B, sharing with parents and guardians important articles from professional reading journals. I feel like that too, that's more for the parents and it's not going to instill this idea of parents, please read with your kids by reading all these professional reading journals about why reading is wonderful for your children. C, recommending books that parents would likely enjoy reading with their children. Yes, I would go with that one because that's giving the parents a tool and a way to see all the different books that they can read with their child and it will help support at-home reading. And D, providing parents and guardians with periodic reports on their children's progress in reading. When they see a bad grade or if they see that their child's not reading at grade level, then they might just put it on the child. Well, if you give this list of, hey, parents, here's a whole list of books that you could read with your kids. It's a positive way to support the at-home reading. And the answer is C. Number four. A sixth grade teacher wants to ensure that the classroom reading environment supports content area learning for the English language learners in the class. Which of the following strategies is likely to be most effective in addressing this objective? So the objective is to ensure that the classroom environment supports learning for the English language learner, basically. So A, replacing classroom content area books. So content area would be like a history book or a science book with simpler texts on the same subjects that the English learners can understand more readily. So if I was teaching a lesson on rocks, would I want to replace all the books on rocks for simpler texts for my English language learner? Probably not. B, providing English language learners with grade level English only content area books to promote academic language. C, making available in the classroom content area texts at various levels that supplement and reinforce the information presented in students' textbooks. Or D, setting up an area in the classroom where students can go to reread content area textbook quietly and independently. So I already said A would not be it. B, I would not choose B because 
that's kind of like drill and kill where you're giving the English language learner English only content books about rocks to pro- promote academic language. But if they can't read it, then they're not going to take it in and see making available uh, at various levels. That's the answer that I would go for, because then you're helping the students who already know what they're reading and then also providing books that are a little easier for people to understand or English language learners to understand. And D, this is this is literally taking the environment part of this question literally by saying, oh, well, you can just set up a quiet area so that they can reread the book. But if they can't reread the level that it's at, then they're not going to read it, even if it's very in a comfortable space. Moving on. No, moving on to number five of the following questions which would be most important for a teacher to consider when interpreting the results of a reading assessment for a particular student something about reading assessment so i don't do it very often because at my school in fifth grade most of my students are capable of reading in the sense where they can blend words and they can pronounce things um for a pretty good level, but for lower elementary, you do these a lot because you need to make sure that you catch how kids are pronouncing things. So a reading assessment might be where you give a piece of paper to a student to read and you're reading one too. With the, And then as they read, you kind of mark off the ones, the words that they pronounced correctly and the words that they did not pronounce correctly or if they struggled with sounding out. Okay, so that's what a reading assessment is. A, how did the student's performance on this assessment compare with that of the student's classmates? B, are these findings sufficient to assign a grade to the student's performance? C, how do these findings relate to the student's performance on other recently administered reading assessments? Or D, do these findings provide information about the student's ranking in regard to national norms of reading achievement? The question was basically asking what's really important for the teacher to consider when you're looking at a reading assessment about a particular student. I guess it would matter a little bit of how the student's performing based on other classmates. So, um, and B, are the findings sufficient to assign a grade? I mean, lower elementary kids don't even really focus on grades. And that's not the most important thing we're looking for right now. So not B. C, how does it relate to the student's performance on recently administered reading assessments? So how does it compare to the other reading assessments that they've taken? That's a good one. And D, I doesn't matter about national norms because right now we're just focused on the student in my classroom. So I would choose between A or C. Let me see how I know... I know I'm gonna go with C. How these, how do these findings relate to the students' performance on other recently administered reading assessments? Because I want to compare. Well, is the one I just gave him, is that aligning with the other reading assessments that the student has taken? Or okay, so the keyword in the question is. What's most important for a teacher to consider when interpreting the results for of a reading assessment for a particular student? So we want to focus on that particular student and how they are doing as an individual, not as just the entire class, not compared to the entire class. So I would go with C. A fourth grade class includes two students with individualized education programs, IEPs. So basically, IEPs are students who have been tested and have been tested and have met with several people that determine the student is going to need some modifications or accommodations for their learning. When planning classroom entry level and progress monitoring assessments for these students, the teacher should the teacher should so a make arrangements for the students to be tested in an environment that is quiet and free from distractions b consult the reading language arts framework for california public schools to determine appropriate assessments for students with ieps c recognize that these students may require additional time to complete their work on these assessments d consult each student's iep to determine any specific testing accommodations required for that student I would go with D. And the reason why I wouldn't go with the other ones is because every student is different and they're kind of stereotyping the 
common IEP IEP strategies that a lot of people give. So A, make arrangements for the students to work in a quiet and f- uh, place. We don't know if that's what the student needs. What if the student needs to be with other students? We don't know if that's what their plan says. B, consult the reading language arts framework for California public schools. Um, you don't need to consult them because the IEP, because those who planned out the IEP already have a plan in place. C, um, they might require more time. We don't know if that's what they need either. So you need to consult each student's IEP differently to determine what they each need specifically. But those are very common strategies. But the best answer would be D. Okay, number seven, a middle school teacher is preparing for the class. A middle school teacher is preparing for the class to take the sixth grade California standards test, CST, in English language arts. That's funny because in private schools, we take the ERBs. We don't take the CSTs. The teacher believes that a student in the class with a Section 504 plan would perform significantly better on the assessment if she were allowed to have frequent supervised breaks within sections of the test. Which of the following guidelines would be most important for the teacher to follow to ensure that arrangements for this student during student during the test are appropriate a providing the student with this testing accommodation only if it is specified in her section 504 plan using good teacher judgment to determine if such an accommodation is warranted following a c following whatever accommodations are generally recommended for students with section 504 plans or d requesting testing accommodation for the students in writing at least eight weeks before the test is given well all 504 plans should already be written out so it's not d C, following whatever accommodations are generally recommended. No, again, it's like an IEP where every student is given an individual plan. And then B, using good teacher judgment. Well, we are not the ones who created the plan, so we got to go with A. You got to look at the specifics of the 504 plan and determine if this child, what this child needs. Tell about the, what the children need. Okay, midway through the year, a second grade teacher con- convenes a student success team to plan additional support for a student who is performing somewhat below grade level standards in reading. A student su- success team is what it sounds like. We're basically a group of teachers or the administration. We come together and determine how can we make this child, how can we help this child succeed? So other members of the team include the student and her parents, another teacher who works closely with the student, and a school administrator. Hey, that's what I just said. In the context of developing an improvement plan for the te- for the student, which of the following pieces of information would be most important for the teacher to communicate to the success team? <clears throat> a. A comparison of the student's reading skills with those of her peers who are performing at grade level. Okay, here's the thing. You never really want to compare one student to another student because we're all on a separate journey. And we just need to make sure that the student is progressing from their previous year or their previous month or the last time they were assessed. We want to make sure that they are progressing at their own level. We are, of course, we look at the grade level standards, but if they are below grade level, we just want to get them to grade level, but we don't want to compare specifically to another student. B, a list of each of the formal and informal reading assessments that the student has taken so far during this school year. That is important, but they're asking for the most important for the teacher to communicate, so we'll come back to that. C, a list of appropriate formal reading assessments that could be used for the student's summative evaluations. Formal reading assessments is very important as well. Eek! D, a description of the student's assessed strengths and weaknesses that could serve as a foundation for addressing her needs. That's good. Okay, so the most important thing that this ch- a stu- the teacher, out of the parents, out of the administration, out of anyone, what can the teacher communicate to the success team? And that would be the student's strengths and weaknesses that she has found, that he sh- or she has found that could help address some of the needs in order to create a plan for the child. Their reading assessment plans are great, but I also need to know what they're what they're strong in and what they're weak in in order to move forward. Uh, You might use the reading assessments to prove the weaknesses and the strengths, but we're looking for an answer that 
says, what's the most important thing? Okay, number nine. A kindergarten teacher plays the following game with students. The teacher says, guess whose name I'm going to say now. The, te- the teacher then says the initial sound of a student's name, M mm, for Mariko, and the children try to guess the name. This activity is likely to promote the reading development of students primarily by helping them a blend separate sounds and words. Well, they're not really blending because they're just saying, they're just thinking of the first initial sound, like M. Mm. B. Recognize that a spoken word is made up of sounds. C. Understand the principles of phonics. And D. Learn how to spell their own names. Uh, They're not really learning how to spell their own names because you're just saying the first sound. Understand the principles of phonics. Well, we're not really blending like her whole name, Mariko, like Mariko. So I'd go with B. Recognize that a spoken word is made up of sounds. Like, hmm. And understanding that her name starts with a sound. Or all, everything we say is a sound. So B. Okay, number 10. Which of the following informal assessments would be most appropriate to use to assess an individual student's phonemic awareness? A. Asking the students to identify the sound at the beginning, middle, or end of a spoken word. What sound do you hear at the end of step? B, having the students listen to a tape recording story while looking at the book and then answer several simple questions about the story. That's reading comprehension. That's if you understand your reading. So that's not phonemic awareness. C, asking the student to identify the letters in the alphabet that correspond to the initial consonant sounds of several familiar spoken words. That could be it. Um, And D, having the student listen to the teacher read aloud a set of words with the same beginning sound, train, trap, trouble, and then repeat the words so assess an individual student's phonemic awareness so phonemic awareness is understanding and being able to decipher the sounds in the beginning the middle and the end of words so if i say the word if i say the word available a v and then a i l so l and then a bowl so you're able to hear all of that in my spoken words so available so i'd go with a c is because because that's more of just the letters and the sounds a kindergarten teacher is preparing a student for phonemic awareness assessment so this kind of goes with number 10 teacher what is a what is this a picture of the teacher displays a picture of a boat student a boat teacher a boat that's right now let's say the word boat together very slowly O T. The student pronounces the word with the teacher. How many sounds do you hear? B O T. The, te- the teacher slowly repeats the word. Three. That's right, three. Now I'd like you to do this for some more words. This assessment would be an appropriate way to test the student's ability to f- perform which of the following phonemic awareness tasks? Counting and blending the phonemes in a word. Identif- B, identifying onsets and rhymes. C, recognizing how many phonemes are contained in a word. And D, relating phonemes to letters. I would have chosen either A or C, but what we're really doing is recognizing how many phonemes are contained contained in a word rather than noticing how we blended it like boat um we're focusing on how many are there so that's c but of course when you're looking at this you have to know what onsets and rhymes are so that you don't choose the wrong answer so an onset is onset is the initial word and then rhymes are the words that flow together afterwards so in the word cat k is the onset and at is the rhymes Okay, let's just do two more and then I'll go on to the essay questions. The use of rhyming text for kindergarten read-alouds is likely to promote the reading development of kindergarten students primarily by A, fostering their phonological phonological awareness, B, increasing their vocabulary knowledge, C, enhancing their understanding of story elements, and D, improving their letter recognition skills. So we're just talking about writing. Uh, We're just talking about rhyming words when you're doing read-alouds. So when you're reading Dr. Seuss, when you're reading poems, and these words rhyme, what is the real point of the kindergarten teacher? So it's not D. They're not really improving their letter recognition because they're not writing the words. It's just read-aloud. C, enhancing their understanding of story elements. We're not really trying to understand the story. This is more for words. B, increasing their vocabulary knowledge. It could, 
it could increase their vocabulary knowledge, except they're not really learning what each word means. They're just saying we're just learning how to rhyme. So A, fostering the phonological awareness so that they can pronounce these words and recognize, hey, this word sounds like this word, like cat, bat, hat, sat, mat. And now they'll know every time they add a different letter in the beginning, they'll be able to still pronounce the word. I know, you forget all these little things that teachers did to teach you how to read. <laughs> okay, 13, and then I'll go on to an essay question just to kind of talk about it with you. Which of the following strategies would best help a kindergarten student who is having difficulty visually distinguishing between the letters B and D, which is very, very common, and people switch B and D around all the time? A, helping the student focus on the directionality of each letter as the student traces it. B, having the student look for the letters within the text of a favorite picture book. Oh, I like that one too. C, repeating the name of each letter several times as the student points to the letter. D, encourage the student to observe closely as the teacher writes the letters. Well, it's not very helpful Helpful if just the teacher's doing it. The kid needs to physically be doing something. C, repeating the name of each letter several times the student points to the letter that's just more like repetition i don't know if that's the most helpful thing that we could do in terms of visually distinguishing between the letters because that's what the question is asking visually distinguishing b having the student look for the letters within the text i mean i feel like that's a really good answer too um i would have chosen between a or b I feel like I would have gone with B and I would have gotten it wrong because it's A, helping the students focus on the directionality of each letter as the student traces it. And that's because they're physically doing something rather than just hunting for words because that way he'll be able to know, like look at how your hand is moving for the B and then how it's moving for the D. I think after I do A though, I would then go to B and then have him open his favorite, he or she, open their favorite picture book and just kind of decipher which one's the B and which one's the D okay moving on whoa 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 okay to some of so this is what i mean by like case studies where it gives you an example and then you have to decipher how you can read and answer questions about it let's go with b okay prior to having students read a textbook chapter on tree classification a fifth grade teacher fifth grade teacher divides students into small groups and gives each group a set of labeled photographs and diagrams of particular type of a particular type of tree so like a pine tree oak tree redwood tree with each tree with each group focusing on a different type of tree the students examine their photographs and diagrams write down as many characteristics as they can about their assigned tree and then present their findings to the whole class as students share their ideas the teacher writes keywords and phrases on the board pine trees equals have cones have needles the needles growing clusters the needles are green in both the summer and winter photographs also and also introduces new terminology like the trees have cones trees that have cones are called conifers the teacher then conducts a guided whole class discussion during which students identify characteristics shared by more than one type of tree having cones and sort of and sort the trees by these characteristics conifers pines firs hemlocks spruces cedars and larches Whew, that's a lot okay i didn't even know some of that Examine task. Using your knowledge of reading instruction, write a response in which you, one, describe how the teacher can effectively differentiate. So differentiate basically means how can you make this lesson applicable to different levels of students? So for this one, they want you to know how you can help an English language learner because that's really difficult for a child who's learning English and you're talking to them about larches and conifers and um, clusters and things like that. Like they wouldn't have that vocabulary because it's not every day they're not words that you use every day so how would you help them and b explain why the strategy you described would be very effective so it's kind of like just an essay of talk about how you would help and the reason why i would use this instructional strategy is because blah 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 blah, blah. therefore da, 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 it will help develop their vocabulary so always reuse the words that they used in the question into your text um, for these kinds of questions, it's very helpful for you to have that test prep guide because then you'll have examples of answers that you can just kind of read over and understand what they're looking for. 
the sample answer that they give. So since the activity and textbook chapter require knowledge of vocabulary that's not often used in everyday speech, hey, that's what I said, and then also give the examples, you know, for example, cones, needles, clustered, and will, it will likely be unfair to English le uh, language learners, the teacher should lead a discussion with them beforehand in which the teacher uses the visuals to draw a picture, draw a diagram, show kids what this means, and then identify and activate their related background knowledge and explicitly teach them more basic but essential academic vocabulary they'll need to complete the activity and understand the textbook chapter successfully. The teacher should reinforce new vocabulary by having the English language learner enter the words in their science notebooks with notes and drawings. This strategy would be effective in addressing the needs of English language learners because it uses, it uses visuals. Right, English language learners, that's huge to understand and to look at what in the world you're talking about. Because even when I learned uh, Mandarin, I'm Korean, uh, my Mandarin teacher would put up little pictures for me to know what she's talking about in Chinese. So she can tell me, you know, water is shui, but to see the water visually there helps me connect the words with the picture, even though I know what water looks like. Um, so you always want to emphasize for English language learners, you'll have notes for them to refer back to, you'll provide pictures for them, and you also want to front load, meaning you want to give them the information that they'll need ahead of time before you start this project so that they don't feel so lost. Okay. Okay, so I hope this was helpful for you. I promise you'll be okay. You'll make it through. Um, the Rico is not as bad as the CSAT. Holy cow, that test is just insane. But that's also because I did multiple subjects. Single subject, if I were to focus on just math, maybe it would have been a little easier because I like math. But in terms of, you know, practicing all a thousand different things, it was very difficult. So power through, you'll make it. The Rika was not as bad, I would say, personally for me, but that's just me. If you want to see a part two of this video where I go over more questions, just let me know. If you like what you see, please like and subscribe, and I'll see you later. Link in bio for the test prep book and the Rika information and all of that. Bye-bye.